Okay. Um, the topic today is the geoforensic study of a school in South Houston. Um, audience, we have a lot of engineers, a lot of people from school districts, um, structural engineers, forensic engineers. So we got a lot of good people there. A lot of people from school districts. Uh, we got about 137 people RSVP. Uh, if you need to reach me, my uh, email is de at geoteching.com. My phone number is 713-699-4000. Um, geotech engineering and testing has been in business for 37 years. We've been doing geotechnical, environmental materials, and geoforensic engineering. We have about 60 people, engineers, technicians, geologists. We work all over Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and we have our own rigs so we can get up there quickly. This presentation will be on YouTube, that Geotech Engineering and Testing channel. Uh, you get a link to the YouTube so you can watch it later too. We have multiple, like 25 presentations on, on YouTube that you can watch and send us an email. We'll give you uh, your PDH. So there's a lot of good stuff there. If you have questions, please type it in in the Q&A section of the presentation here. And um, so we're going to be talking about geoforensic evaluation of the buildings, really uh, school buildings. Uh, this is an elementary school located in South Houston. It was built in or about 1978. It's about 60,000 square foot. Um, these are some pictures of the school. Notice these trees right next to the building here. They planted these trees at the same time they start building the uh, school. So these are not the initial trees out there. Um, you can see the drainage is pretty flat. They got these bed liners here. The gutters drain right next to the foundation. Kind of a very flat area, very poor drainage. It's got two wings, the cafeteria. It's a, these are the wings, main office is up here. Um, we did this project in two phases. Phase one was to review the existing reports, data, uh, review uh, the photographs and topo maps. Uh, conduct site visits, develop school cost estimate for a phase two study. So we kind of did this in two phases for the for the school district. Uh, uh, phase one was review of existing reports, review of aerial photographs, conduct site visit, develop school and cost estimate, and develop a scope of work for phase two. But phase one consists of review the initial geotechnical report, all the structural drawings, site topography, architectural drawings, any forensic report done by anybody else, site vicinity maps, project timeline, construction pictures, any pictures prior to construction, plumbing leak, sewer leak, micro elevations, tree survey, um, and you know anything else like depositions and the compaction testing, all the material testing. I we didn't get most of this information. Uh, we, it was not available, so we didn't even get the geotechnical report, and we got a one-page structural drawing. So there was no sole report. That's all we got. The structural drawing. You got piers at eight point five foot. Now remember, this site is highly expansive soils. That was nineteen seventy eight. They had some interior beams in there. Essentially, the building was supposed to be uh, supported on drill piers. The existing pier depths are uh, designed depth were 8.5 feet, belt to shaft ratio of 2.1 to 3.1. The floor slab was only 4.5 inches. The great beams were supposed to be 8 to 20 inches width, depth of the beams 16 to 20 inches, which is not very much. The foundation system was very weak. Um, did some micro elevations in 2016. We had the uh, differential movements across the building of somewhere between five to seven inches. So there was some significant movement uh, at the building. 
aerial photographs, when you look at the site in 1953, it was just grassland. There were no trees there. And that's 1978. They will build a school. Lots of developments here. There was nothing before. Before, just there was no development around it. So time flies. So in 1953, site was undeveloped, covered with grass, undeveloped. 78, school building, residential development. 2002, no changes. 2016, no changes. The area was pretty flat. That's the topo map. It's a very flat area. We went out there to look at this thing. We look at the interior of the school and outside the school. Look at the interior. That's what the interior looked like. Lots of sheet rock cracking, lots of separation, more cracking, lots all over the place. The exterior, we looked at a bunch of different locations around the school, very flat drainage, a few area drains, lots of cracks out there uh, in the brick. They didn't have good brick joints. There was hardly any brick joints in it. So we had a lot of cracks in the brick. Drainage conditions. And you can see the gutters coming over here, extending it out in some locations. Uh, they had the bed liners here, the blocks, and holding the water next to foundation, some area drains. Some of the area drains were filled up with soil. See the bed liners here, you got the blocks and the soil trapping the water next to the foundations. Some of the gutters were missing. And you can see that the draining right next to the foundation some gutters just drained right next to the foundation. There was a big hole next to the foundation. Bad drainage. Very flat drainage. The grass was almost at the level of the, 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 the brick. So we hardly had any uh, exposed grade beams. Typically, you want to have somewhere about six to eight inches of uh, uh, exposed grade beams, especially on the commercial projects. I really like to have more like 12 inches of uh, exposed concrete before you run into the brick. So grass was at the brick line. Trees, when they built this thing here, they built all these oak trees around it. So these trees starts growing, starting sucking the moisture from underneath the foundation. Some of these areas starts dropping. You see the big trees next to the foundation. Yeah, a lot of trees out there, a lot of oak trees. So we did the phase one, structural drill, drawings indicate piers at 8.5 feet, differential elevations five to seven inch, significant cracks in the brick, brick joints were missing, drainage around the building was not good, gutters not draining properly, lots of oak trees, exterior beams were extending, were not extending above the topsoil. So the topsoil was at the brick line. And of course, the brick did not have proper joints. You want to have joints out there in your brick. And you want to have a brick joint spacing of about 20 feet. We need expansion joints in brick because if the brick and all the building materials expand and contract with changes in temperature, humidity, and other environmental conditions, because these materials move at different rates, because nature will put the uh, brick joint for you if you forget. You need to put brick joints periodically in long walls at offset in walls where short, short runs of masonry meets the long runs at outside corners where different uh, materials meet uh, at, um, at junctions with different functions or different heights. So it's kind of give you an idea where the brick joints should be. The phase two was consist of a site visit, field exploration, lab testing, reviewing the existing data, analysis, identify cause of foundation and repair techniques. We went out there and uh, did some borings around the buildings and inside the buildings. See B8, B7, B10, B9 were inside. 
B1, B2, B3, you know, B4, B5 were outside. Well, also these, these blue areas are test pits. We dug next to the foundation, see what can what we get in the foundation parts. So when we did the borings out there, next to the trees, trying to get root fibers. Root fibers tells us about the depth of active zone. That's the zone at which soil experiences shrink swell problems. So we do the borings next to the trees. We had a lot of clays out there. These are fat clays. We tested them. We measured the water table. There was no water. This is the stratigraphy. You see all from top to bottom, it's all clays. Just hit all clay all the way, highly expansive soils. You know, we have fat clays. Here's the PI of 40, PI of 60, 69, 62. The soils were good. They were not that, you know, they're not very strong, but they were good. So we got highly uh, expansive soils, moisture content 24, close to the plastic limit. That means the soils were kind of dry. So, which is not a surprise when you have all these trees next to the building, to suck the moisture, the soils underneath your foundation is pretty dry. So if you get a big rainfall, it starts heaving. That's P2, you got PI 69, 67, 57. B3, PIs of 67, 68, 62. B4, PIs of 55, 67, uh, 72. B5, PIs of 72, 73. I mean, this is expensive, expensive. B6, 46, 67, 58, all clay. We went out and dug next to the foundation and try to expose the great beams, see what's the depth of the great beams. We found water in some locations, you know, what we call perch water table, and next to some of these great beams. And uh, they got filled up with water. That means there's water underneath the foundation. It could be because of the plumbing leak, sewer leak, bad drainage. We measured the beams, the width. Test pit number one, what we did was the, the beam was 22.5 inches, design was 20 inches, the great beam depth was 13.5, great beam width should have been designed as 10 inches. We had water in, the, in there when we did the pit, and we had a bunch of roots, half an inch diameter tree roots going underneath the foundation. So here's uh, test pit number two. The great beam was 20.5 inches. Design was 20 inches. It was 17 inches below grade. And then we we did we had lots of root fibers, about 0 0.5 inch in diameter. Again, roots are going underneath the foundation. Uh, test pit number three, it was 24 inches deep, the great beam, and 24 inches below grade. That means there was no exposed concrete above the grass. Design great beam thickness was 20 inches. Beam design was 10 inches. We measured almost 14 inches. Topsoil, lots of root fibers, three quarter of an inch roots going underneath the foundation system. And uh, looking at it, it says topsoil was one inch above the great beam. So topsoil was uh, touching the, 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 uh, the brick. Here we hit the uh, total great beam test pit number. This is another test pit, test pit number, uh, number four. The beam was 26 inches, design was 20, depth below grade 21. Design, design width was 10 inches. Our measurement of the width was more than 10 inches. Topsoil, root fibers, no water. Test pit five. Zero to three feet is all fat clay. Then we had total beam thickness of uh, 22 inches. Design was 20 inches. Depth below grade was 20 inches. That means it was only two inches of, uh, of concrete above the grass. Design grade beam was 10 inches wide. We measured more than 10 inches. Uh, so we said but we found a bunch of root fibers and we had water in the test fit at 24 inches. So there was water underneath this slab. And this is the last test pit. We dug out next to the foundation from zero to three feet. We had fat clay. 
Gumbo clays. Total gray beam thickness, 20.75 inches. Below grade was 20.75 inches. That means there was no, basically, free board above the grass on the concrete. The beam was designed as 20 inches by 10 inches. Um, basically, we found a bunch of roots and uh, all the way to 36 inches within any water. Floor slab coring. We core the existing pavement to see what the thickness is and what kind of strength it has. So we core it at different locations. We measure the, the, the width. So basically construction requirement for floor slab that's supposed to be four and a half inches in thickness, it cannot be more than one, one eighth of an inch in, above 4.5 and less than one fourth of an inch below that. That's ACI 117. Our measurements of the cores were four inches, 3.8, 4.2, and 4.5. Again, the design was uh, 4.5 inches. None of them met the design requirements of the thickness of the slab. We broke those concrete uh, cores and we got strengths of 2,252, 2,750, 2,859, 4746. We didn't have any specs to compare the strengths to. Uh, so we typically went by ACI. He says, if you do at these three cores, none of the single core should be less than 75% of the design strength, F prime C. And the average should not, you know, be more than uh, 85%, not just less than 85% of the design strength. So if you assume the concrete here was 3,000 PSI, none of the cores should have been less than 2,250. An average of three cores should not be less than 2,550. So if you look at the core test results, the first one is 2,252, which is two PSI above the minimum. Then average of the these four or three, uh, they are above 25.50, so the concrete strength passes. So the strength passes. We did interior borings. See what kind of a soils went underneath this slab here. And we got samples. These are the interior borings. In some areas, we found sand. Then below that, we found clays. Essentially, what we found was uh, zero to 0.5 feet was well, silty sand. Below that was uh, lean clay, about two foot of uh, structural fill, zero to six in some areas. There was no structural fill. We have found clay with sand, zero to 25 in some boring, we find all clay. Root fibers extend to a depth of 10 feet. That means your active zone depth is about 12 foot. It's two foot below the lowest root fiber. It's very important in geotechnical reports to show the depth of root fibers to estimate the depth of active zone. The active zone is the depth that fish soil experiences shrink swell problems. So soil properties, you know, layer one was sand, which is non-expansive. You don't put sand underneath the, your slab in areas where you got expansive soils. Because sand would transmit all that water all over the floor slabs, causing heave of the expansive soils. So you don't put sand in there. You put uh, select fill underneath the floor slabs which is sandy clay, silty clay, lean clay. Fill, you know, basically the layer two in some areas was lean clay with PIs 14 and 17, which is good. And below that, it was all fat clay with PIs ranging from 40 to 73. So yeah, a lot of expansive soils. And so if you go around Houston, start about, you know, the woodlands here, which is Conroe IST, near the woodlands, you know, in that area, they've got usually sandy soils out there near uh, 336 and I-45. Start going north on the Condor ISD. You get lots of fat clays, really gumbo clays with trees. You go Kingwood, which is uh, part of the, uh, could be Edge ISD or part of the uh, New Kenya ISD. Some areas are sandy. Some areas got highly expansive soils with trees out there. You go to Channel View, Laporte ISD, Pasadena ISD, Paraline ISD, Missouri City, which is part of the Fort Bend ISD, Sugarland, Fort Bend ISD, Rosenberg, Fort Bend ISD. All these areas, they got highly expansive soils with some trees, lots of movement. 
So the geotechnical engineer should have some idea of forensic engineering when you come up with design information for these schools. Uh, friends with ISD, got highly expansive soils in that area. Start going out there to Galveston, Leak City, all those areas got highly expansive soils out there. Start going to KDISD. The soils are sandy, but parts of the area got expansive soils. But for the most part, the soils are real sandy. You start going out to the Bridgeland, Fairfield, all those areas. You got highly expansive soils. I mean, uh, uh, sandy soils with little bit of expansive soils. Tomball, you know, some areas highly expansive, some areas real sandy. Magnolia ISD has got moderately expansive soils, sandy soils in some areas, and highly expansive soils in some other areas. HISD, you know, kind of like a lot of the HISD projects, they got highly expansive soils and uh, like Pearland and all that stuff. These areas are highly expansive soils. One of the concepts that we uh, look at when we do geotechnical work for our schools is potential vertical rise, PVR. PVR tells us how much heave an area can experience based on the soil types uh, and the PI and all that stuff. This is the map uh, I developed for the Houston area. For example, if you look at the you know, Fort Bend ISD, you can have as much as six inches of heave on some of the areas. In near Greatwood, Rosenberg, Richmond, Sugarland, all those areas. You go to A Leaf ISD and stuff, highly expansive soils. You're going to have about four to six inches of movement in near A Leaf. Conroe ISD you can have somewhere about one to four inches. Splendora ISD over here, for example, uh, they, you know, the soils are really not that expansive, real sandy soils. You go to Kingwood and you know, HISD or New Kenny ISD, you know, as much as three inches of movement in some areas. Laporte ISD, Alvin ISD, Pearland ISD. Well, these areas have got highly expansive soils. You go out there to Deer Park, you got lots of expansive soils in Deer Park, a lot of movement. So you got to watch out for those things. The PVR for most buildings should be less than one inch when you design them. So that means your slab should not move, move more than one inch. That's what you designed for. For this site, the boring B1 had a PVR of four inches. B2 boring at 4.8, B3 4.8, B4 4.6, B5 5.1, B6 4.4, B7 3.3, B8 3.7 inches, B9 3.4, B10 3.2 inches. Uh, Elevations were done. The macro elevations of the slab were used to, to see, to evaluate the heave or uh, settlement. Of course, a job like this is mostly heave. There's no settlement. Um, then we check with the for Foundation Performance Association car criteria to see if the slab has failed or not. So what we did was this was the building here. They had a bunch of wings. We use a, basically a zip level system and uh, got the elevations uh, of the floor slabs. And so we have cafeteria, corridor B, corridor C, library, classrooms, corridor A, main office, corridor D. So if you look at these different little buildings, that's corridor A, differential across the, this uh, area was about seven inches. You go to corridor B, the differential across the slab was six inches. You go to corridor C, differential elevations across the slab was two inches. You go to corridor D, basically the differential movements was three inches. You go to the library, the differential movement was almost three inches. That's high, you know, but that's the low. That's kind of shows a lot of heave. The area that's dark brown, that shows the areas of that's heaving up a lot. So you can see the dark brown areas where the slab is heaving up uh, all over the place. So you can look at these drawings and see the heave. And of course, your limitation is L over 360. That means uh, your slab should not move one inch in 30 feet. No, no more than that. That's allowable deflection. And uh, we evaluate these deflections based on the 
documents by post interesting Institute, Slab on Ground Foundations. Look at the elevations. We also did uh, uh, look at the same thing for Foundation Performance Association. Basically, we look at the deformation, which is change of shape of the foundation after original foundation construction. We look at deflection, which is maximum deviation from a straight line between two points. And we also look at what's called deflection ratio, which is deflection divided by horizontal distance over which the deflection occurs. And we also look at tilt, if the whole thing moves uniformly, which is basically tilt is a planar, planar rotation measured over the length or width of the foundation. The allowable tilt is about 1%. American Society of Civil Engineers says that corresponds to six inches for a 50 foot slab. We'll also look at what's called slope between the points. Slope is differential elevation between two points divided by horizontal distance between them. So, in that, you know, when you look at the measurements of deflection between point one and three, this is the correct deflection. This is not the correct deflection. So, this is a lot less than this. This is TRCC performance and standards for like buildings, actually residential. That's the Texas Residential Construction Commission. They're not in business anymore, but they give some guidelines. Like they say, floor slab crack should not be more than one eighth of an inch. Flat work should not crack more than one fourth of an inch. Flat work separation joints uh, should not be more than one inch. Stairs, Three eighth of an inch settlement maximum, carports maximum crack three sixteenth, sheetrock one thirty second, brick 0.25 inches maximum separation, and uh, the gaps in the brick mortar no more than 0 0.2, um, 0.25 inches. So the crack itself in the brick should not be more than one eighth of an inch. So if you run the elevations, for example. On the floor slabs that we did, we just did. What we found on the on the elevations using this technique, the deflection was L over 110, the allowable is L over 360. That means that there was more deflection than allowed. So the deflection failed. Tilt was 0.4%, is allowed 1%, it passed. So essentially the deflection on this slab failed because it was just too much deflection. So in corridor A, we had L over 110, allowable was L over 360, it failed. And the, the tilt, you know, in the actual was 0.4. So the tilt passed, allowable is one inch, it passed, but the deflection failed. Corridor B, L over 645, deflection passes, 0.45 on the tilt, passes. Corridor C, L over 567, Allowable uh, L over really 360. I don't know why it says three, uh, uh, 285. It should be said three, uh, 360. Um, so it passes. And the tilt is 0.11. Less than 1.0, it passes. Corridor D, L over 261. Allowable is 360. It fails. The tilt is 0 0.5. Less than 1.0, it passes. So we have two areas that the slab fails due to the deflection. That's corridor A and corridor D. Reasons for distress, inadequate design, poor construction, poor quality material, poor maintenance, wear and tear, sewer leak, plumbing leak, causes of foundation distress in, in, in sufficient pier depths, insufficient select structural fill on the floor slabs, Trees very close to the building, improper concrete slab thickness, inappropriate depth of rebar placement, using silty sand soils as fill material. You should not use silty sands underneath the floor slabs in highly expansive soils. You text the water everywhere. And uh, poor drainage around the building. So when you do a school design or any commercial building, if you have expansive soils, you have to look at these concepts. You determine your pier depth, you got to look at what we called moisture active zone. Is moisture active zone 
is if you get the root fibers, it's two foot below their lowest root fiber, okay? And so it's two foot below. Or when you hit a sand layer or you hit a rock layer, uh, when the change in suction is less than 0 0.27 PF, when the liquidity index of the soil tested is vertical, uh, depth of slick, slick insides, slick insides that are cracks in the soil, and uh, when you know the historical water table, which is hard to do. So in this case, you estimate the, the moisture active zone, and then from that, you can calculate what we call movement active zone. Movement active zone is usually equal to smaller than moisture active zone. In Texas, the movement active zone is about 10 foot in Houston area. Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin is about 15 foot. So zero movement line in Houston is about 10 foot in expansive soils. So you gotta have to design an active zone of zero movement, movement active zone of 10 foot in Houston. Then you gotta anchor your piers to resist this uplift. And then how you, that's how you determine your pier depth. So, uh, the, you know, the active zone is deeper in the area where you got tree roots, because trees suck moisture, your active zone is deeper. So when you design piers, you got to design for compressive loads, where you got expansive soils and skin friction to, res to resist downward movement. And then in areas where we got expansive soils, you got to design for uplift, which is going to control. Uplift is more important. So uplift above the zero movement line, the soil grabs the pier, wants to push it up. You got to anchor it down. Down. You don't. You don't count on the bell to resist uplift, because by the time the bell is moved up two, three inches, and you already have a bunch of sheetrock cracks and floor slab cracking and the door sticking problems. Pier depths in West University, Bel Air, Tanglewood, Brace Heights, Marlin, got to be more than eighteen feet. So if I'm doing stuff in, for example, for for Ben ISD. You know, my pier is going to be about 20 foot deep at least. You know, out there, same with A-Leaf ISD. Same with Deer Park ISD, Pasadena ISD. Now, if I'm in Katy and the soils are sandy, I put my piers about 12 foot deep. You know, so if I'm in the Woodlands area, I put them about 12 foot. If I'm north of Conroe, in Conroe ISD, I put them about 20 foot deep. You've got highly expansive out there. So just depending on what kind of soils you run into, uh, you're going to have to look at those pier depths. I would have put a pier depth at eight to 10 foot in highly expansive soils, like in Pearland, Friendswood, you know, uh, Fort Bend, all those areas. So repair techniques and risks. This is how we tell them how to repair this thing. Level one, improve drainage and landscaping improvements. Level one A, put improve the drainage and landscaping and put moisture barriers in there. Level two B, do chemical injection and improve drainage. Level uh, level two C, do underpinning and do drainage and landscaping. Landscaping. So, of course, the level at one was remove all the trees around the building. When he does that, that soil starts heaving up. That foundation around the edges will move up to the original, you know, condition. Check the on-site soils in the planter areas next to the great beams. Don't go out there and put a bunch of sand in the planter areas. Make sure you put select fill. If you put top soils on top of expansive soils, you develop that perch water table. And of course, water just ponds there, and that will be a problem. Sand and cohesion less soils five feet away from the exterior beams. So what it says, put the top soil at least five feet away from the exterior beams. Bed liners should be removed around the planter areas, and the area has got to be graded so that it drains you know, properly. Don't put bed liners in the areas where you've got expansive soils next to the foundation. That's not a good practice. Remove all the soils around the exterior beams to a depth of six inches so that you will have at least six inches of concrete exposed, and they're regraded that way. Level two, improved drainage and landscaping improvement. Positive drainage everywhere, 5% slope in the grass within 10 foot of the building. Level the floor slabs if you need to using polyurethane materials such as a Eurotech or other techniques. Check the roof drainage. 
Make sure that the gutters are appropriate for the structure. Uh, install brick joint at 20 foot spacing. Make sure your gutters drain at least 10 foot away from foundation and replace the old bricks with new bricks. Level 2B, 2A, you can put a moisture barrier around the thing, uh, around your building, remove all the trees and uh, drainage landscaping like we talked about before. Put some moisture barriers or root barriers to a depth of six feet. Level the flooring slab using you know, polyurethane material. Make sure you got po proper drainage and gutters and all that stuff. Power, polyurethane lifting is just, if your slab is out of level, you can lift it up, you can put this polyurethane material. It's uh, two chemicals essentially in these tanks. And you drill a hole in the ground and uh, you put your uh, tip in there and then you connect your machine to it. Start injecting. Once these two materials mix with each other, they start basically heaving up. They start what we call gel time. It starts lifting up the, the, the slab. So it becomes level. Oh, you can do it interior and exterior, driveways. It was like that and you lift it up. Does not change the soil characteristics. If the soil continue to move, the foundation will move. This is the moisture barrier. We want to go down six foot deep. This is a 15 mil vapor barrier. You got to put it all around the whole building. Everywhere. Level 2B, do a chemical injection. Remove all the trees, drainage, chemical injection to a depth of 10 to 12 foot. And uh, soil, soil swell test got to be done. And really, the, the, uh, the floor slabs should not you know, heave more than uh, one inch. So... <laughs> Here's a chemical injection. Uh, you can do it to pre-swell building sites or stop swelling of pavements. This is the tank that the chemical injection come in. It's a mix of chemicals in here. We got clay pl uh, platelets. You got negative charge. This is water. You got positive charge. Uh, they want to absorb each other. And if you have uh, no chemicals, a cation exchange, which removes the sodium and potassium, put calcium in it, it doesn't want to absorb as much water. So it doesn't shrink as much. So that's what ca cation exchange is. Uh, it reduces the, the negative uh, platelet charge as well. So it's very important when you do chemical injection, you got to do it you know, at least to a depth of 10 foot in Houston areas, in places such as Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, it may have to go down to at least 15 feet because your, the active zone is deeper in those areas. That's a kind of a picture of chemical injection. You got a dozer with the head on this thing. You, this is Sienna Plantation out there in Fort Bend County. We're doing chemical injection on it. The chemicals are coming through these holes. And you do chemical injection out there. You can see it all over. This is a Braidswood area um, near HIST project. Highly expansive soils. That's the hole when the chemical injection is done. Here's for existing building. If you want to stabilize some of these existing building, make the soil non-expansive. You go out there and do chemical injections around the building that kind of provide some relief to the swelling. You can do it by hand. You can do it in the interior of the building. So you drill a hole, <coughs> you inject it through the concrete, or in this case, they're removing the slab and do chemical injection and putting a new slab on there. 
So, you know, basically the area of the chemical injection is the whole floor slab of the building. Level C foundation underpinning and drainage. You do all the drainage, you know, improvement. You go on the underpin and level the foundations uh, with piers, hillco piles, and, and they got to be at a depth of 18 feet minimum. You got to cut the top of the existing piers before you do any underpinning. Okay, well, these are not supposed to be here. So phase three was develop plans and specifications uh, for repair and help the contractor develop cost estimate foundation repairs. In phase five, four was to monitor the field implementation, verify the effect, efficiency of chemical injections or underpinning. So that's kind of basically uh, concludes our presentation. This presentation is on YouTube. Uh, it's gonna be there on YouTube, you can go watch it. And uh, the program evaluation, uh, just kind of tell me how you like this uh, seminar. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to turn it on. So you all just kind of uh, make some comments. Uh, I would appreciate it if you guys uh, send me pictures of the distressed areas or schools or buildings. That's what makes it interesting. If you need to contact me, my contact information is de at geoteching.com, 713-699-4000. These are a bunch of new seminars that we're going to be doing coming up, August, August, August. Um, if you have your emails, we're going to put you on the notice that these are coming up. You can listen to some of these presentations. You're going to get a one-hour PDH on this thing. Any questions? You guys are quiet, so see. Any questions on this? Okay, I don't see any questions, so, okay, I got one. Can you say what repair was chosen by the district? Uh, I can't really tell you that because we did our work and uh, we finished it. We didn't hear anything anymore on the project. So I don't know what the district do on this project. Any other questions? Well, y'all have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much.